Um, Mancuso developed a score. She added up the different scenarios, the mean scores on the different scenarios, and developed a score for the conflict and, and the um, constituency service areas. And I, the, the second study is the Allen study in the UK, and the last one is I did the same. And you can see here that um, the conflict of interest, the lower the score, the lower the tolerance for corruption. So here, the, the low score in Ireland, we have a lower score for conflict and a higher score on the service. So we're more tolerant of constituency service type activities. You can see here, I just mapped out the scores on, on a graph. Um, Mancuso devised these, this is the original researcher in England, these, these um, names for the different groups. The Puritans were intolerant of both um, constituency service and um, conflict type scenarios. The servants were um, highly toler tolerant of constituency service. Um, muddlers, she said, had topsy-turvy ideals um, in that they were to intolerant of constituency service and very tolerant of conflict of interest. And entrepreneurs, as she described, as viewing office as a business rather than a calling, willing to accept any activity as long as it did not contravene some written statute. Um, there is roughly the same proportion in each group. However, it does not mean that they all have the same attitudinal orientation. It's useful to um, categorize the Irish respondents according to um, the mean of the UK study, and then we can see a, a true comparison. You can see here, the S is the, I is the Irish study. Yeah, the S here, this is the Irish study. You can see here that um, this is the current Irish respondents uh, um, based on the outlook of the, the first UK, which is the pre-reform UK study, just to see if the legislation in Ireland had actually any effect on, on the Irish um, Oireachtas members. And um, you can see here that we have 50% servants, which is huge compared to the number in the UK, but again, that's possibly because of our close ties to the constituency. Um, the Puritans, we have 43%, which is much higher, um, so they're intolerant of, of both types of activity. And we have no muddlers, and we only have 7% entrepreneurs. So the ethics legislation is having some effect. Um, why is there differences between Ireland and the UK? Um, possibly because of the PRS TV system, which leads to marginal um, election results and the small constituencies. There's a small number of, um, of voters to, to the TDs. Um, and the coalition government, which is kind of a circular explanation, um, but it reinforces that. And also, um, culture and religion in Ireland versus England. Um, studies um, have shown that Catholicism or Catholic societies tend to be more um, tolerant of corruption and particularly the type of corruption, um, nepotism and that, that type of corruption that's very common in, in Ireland, the kind of who you know instead of the person, personalism would be the who you know instead of what you know idea which the appointments of state boards would reinforce that here. And in conclusion, um, the legislation has had an effect, although I have to say that it's possibly limited because, uh, because of the political structures, it's not having any, um, any real impact on the constituency service type scenarios. And that still leaves a huge gray area for Oireachtas members, Oireachtas members to, 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 um, to really kind of have to decide themselves on their, on their own ethics. Um, and also, there was a question there at the start um, on the Secretary General. Uh, uh, the, the question was, the Secretary General, a minister brings the Secretary General of his department to a party meeting to inform the minister's party colleagues of an upcoming complex de policy debate. And we can see that 53% found this not corrupt. In fact, in 2007, um, Standards and Public Office annual report, the, public, the Standards Public Office Commissioner specifically wrote an answer um, because the Secretary General had been faced with this quandary and had written asking for a decision on it and it was specifically mentioned in the report that this was um, not proper and that any any briefings that should be given should be given on an all-party basis and this was unethical use of you know a, a minister's access to secretary generals or to high level civil servants unfortunately we can see that this was in the same year the survey was done um, only a few months after the report was issued and unfortunately our Oireachtas members were not aware of this so we kind of have to wonder how much of an impact SIPO is having on them. Now since I've done this um, study I have to say that SIPO has seemed to be taking a harder line and that they have reported I believe some, um, I'm not sure if it was councillors or TDs to um, the DPP because of non-return of um, election expenses so maybe they, they themselves are changing their attitude. I just was going to say uh, for change I think to strengthen the Standards and Public Office Commission, I think they're, they're doing that themselves. They're taking a harder line.
and also. The constituency service would be less important to voters in the sense of medical cards or, or appointments um, you know, with, in, in hospitals and things like that um, if our public service was more responsive to, con to, to, to the public. So therefore, as, and that is happening, and most, most departments have a customer service charter now, which they probably didn't have 20 years ago. So things are changing from a public service perspective. Um, and also, I think that increasing, there's been a lot of research done on localism and the, the connection of politicians to their voters is seen to be um, to increase the likelihood of corruption. If constituency sizes were increased in Ireland and the number of um, Oireachtas members was reduced slightly, it probably would limit their ability to perform constituency service and therefore would limit, limit the corruption that's involved in this area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, we'll move on to our final uh, opening contribution for the evening from Professor Gary Murphy, who's the Associate Professor at the School of Government and Law out in DCU. He's also a regular contributor to uh, the media. And he's going to pick up on a thread which was opened by both John and Gillian in terms of lobbying and the regulation of lobbying uh, in uh, both Ireland and also worldwide. So, Gary, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, David. Um, first of all, I'm very happy uh, to be here. I'd like to thank uh, to John uh, and TI for extending uh, the invitation to me uh, to speak here tonight. And uh, I, I pose this question, but I don't really want, I'm not going to answer it really. Uh, but what I hope to do is to give some thoughts on uh, why a register of lobbyists is a good idea in terms of countering uh, corruption um, and countering the perception of corruption. And I take John's point completely about the difficulty with perception as distinct from real uh, corruption. Uh, our view. Uh, is that, uh, and when I say, or oh, I've been involved in a lobbying project with my colleagues uh, Raj Chari from Trinity and uh, John Hogan uh, from DIT. This book, uh, I just want to give myself a plug, uh, came out last uh, last May, um, and in it we we basically examine and analyse the lobbying regulations which are extant across the across the world, basically. Um, and what we mean by lobbying, I suppose, might be a good place uh, to start. Well, lobbying activity, I think John alluded to it, is basically the act of individuals or groups with varying and specific interests uh, attempting to influence decisions at the political level. And this influence can take a myriad or a variety of forms, including uh, direct communications with government officials, uh, offering presentations, so people come in to say I'll offer a presentation to the Department of the Environment or whoever, um, drafting reports, whether these be uh, sought uh, by the Department and the genesis of actually this, uh, this research comes in, uh, the fact that Raj Chari and myself uh, tendered for a, uh, a project to anal analyse and assess the regulation of lobbyists worldwide and to make recommendations to the Irish government and what we might do here. Uh, I'll hold up my hand and say we offer the princely sum of €24,000 uh, to complete this, uh, this project, which took uh, the guts of a year. Uh, I was then horrified subsequently to see that uh, Monica Leach, of course, who many of you would know, uh, was uh, employed as a PR consultant by the very same department for the most astronomical sums. And here I was, you know, saying, you know, 24000 oh, it's way too much, they'll never, you know. Uh, I have a computer which I got from it, it's sort of falling apart now. Uh, we employed a research assistant, we, you know, documented it all tremendously carefully, uh, and I beg to suggest that the department got pretty good uh, value for money, and of course we got this book and various other papers out of it, so we didn't do too bad uh, either, but that uh, report, uh, which subsequently became this book, is on the minister's desk. I spoke to the Minister for the Environment last, there is a, uh, last Thursday night, uh, and he assures me that uh, the Register of Lobbyists, which I'll come to in a minute, is still on uh, the government's agenda. But more of that uh, in a minute. But draft reports, telephone uh, communications, as John alluded to, all these things are, are lobbying, uh, lobbying activity. Um, so what do we mean by the regulation of lobbyists, I think, would be, would be something to talk about. Well, it's the idea that political systems have established rules, regulations, rules um, which lobby groups must follow when trying to influence uh, government officials. So there is a rule written down that has to be followed uh, by, uh, by a group. Now, we have presented this work at a variety of, uh, or to a variety of organisations and institutes, the Public Relations Institute of Ireland for one and, and others. Uh, 
I was on the radio with Pat Kenny defending it at one stage, and he said, you know, this basically would stop people talking to their local TD. To which I replied, that's just nonsense, basically. And it rejects a century of political culture. You do not have to register as a lobbyist. You know, if my light at the end of my road in Castlenock is broken, I don't have to register to talk to Minister Lennon and say, you must fix the bloody light at the end of, you know, wherever, Oak Tree Grove is where I live. Um, this would be to deny a complete century of, of Irish political culture. What we're talking about is interest groups lobbying to get decisions made that benefit them and their members. That's what we are, uh, uh, what we're talking about there.